Our Father, we certainly are grateful and thankful for the privilege and the opportunity and the, even the place that you've given us that we can meet this morning to do our best to put a smile on your face. Lord, we have uh, so much as Christians, we have so much to look forward to someday in glory. You never said that the trip there would be easy. You did say that we'd not have to go alone no matter what we may go through in life. For that, I'm grateful. I pray that everything that's done this morning, everything that's said would be pleasing to you, that will honor you and give you glory. And we'll thank you in advance for what you'll do. In Christ's name, amen. Jesus said to his disciples, I will go prepare a place, a land of many mansions where we'll spend eternal days. Then he ascended to the land he promised to prepare. Well, I am so excited because I know I'm going there. They want to call it heaven, beautiful country of Canaan. Place where the saints will be living, the land so fair. Sweet, sweet, precious land of Beulah, home of the holy hallelujah. I'm happy now that I can tell you I know I'm going there. I have made my reservation for that city long ago. There had an old time halt where the Savior saved my soul. If I should die tomorrow before I meet him in the air, I know that I am ready cause I know I'm going there. You may want to call it heaven, beautiful country of Canaan, place where the saints will be living, the land so fair. Sweet, sweet, precious land of Beulah, home of the holy hallelujah. I'm happy now that I can tell you I know I'm going there. You may want to call it heaven, beautiful country of Canaan, place where the saints will be living, the land so fair. Sweet, sweet, precious land of Beulah, home of the holy hallelujah. I'm happy now that I can tell you I know I'm going there. as we continue to sing to God be the glory great things he hath done you know we set this day aside to honor our pastoral staff but as brother Mickey's already said our number one goal around here is to honor Christ Jesus our Lord and Savior to God be the glory great things he hath done you sing it with us this morning here we go to God be the glory great things he had done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord 
had taught us great things he had done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder our transport when Jesus we see praise the Lord praise the Lord let the earth hear his voice praise the Lord praise the Lord let the say one other thing I forgot to say earlier. Many of y'all will notice down here in front there's a painting. Uh, some of y'all may be in the back. You cannot see it. But there's a painting that was given to us by, uh, to go into our uh, sacrifice Sunday. This is a Thomas Kincaid painting. It's a numbered painting. And uh, it was donated to be sold. It was given to us by Jim and Linda Brothers. And we appreciate that so much. If you've ever been to their house... They've got more paintings of Thomas Kincaid than Thomas Kincaid's got, I believe. But anyhow, we appreciate it so much, and we're looking forward to our Sacrifice Sunday on uh, November the what? 8th. November the 8th. So we look forward to that, okay? All right. Bless the Lord. Now, when are they going to do whatever they're going to do? After we do this? Okay. Y'all want to sing with us? Yeah. Do you, do, you, you wanna, do you sing better standing up or sitting down? Standing down. You like sit down? Well, just do whatever you want to do. I don't really care, okay? Uh, we're going to stand, but y'all do whatever y'all want to do, okay? Here we go. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. seated. I was just looking at uh, Jake and Jack and Clayton. It hadn't been a, but a blink in an eye that y'all were sitting over here where they're sitting, you know. Now y'all big and ugly and, and <laughs> all that stuff, you know. All right. Okay. All right, we want to take some time this morning and, and we have some special groups who are wanting to do some uh, 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 presentations for our pastor and our pastoral staff. Let me make one quick announcement before we get that started. Tonight we're having Singing Under the Stars. And um, I've been watching the weather pretty close, and I don't think there's going to be any stars out. Uh, there's a pretty good chance of rain, but never fear. We'll just move inside, okay? So we'll move inside tonight. And here's the other change. Pay attention right here. We're going to go back to doing it at 6 o'clock. Okay, our normal service time, 6 o'clock, and we'll do Singing on the Stars. We're going to have cake and homemade ice cream. We'll uh, break at some point and do that. M most of you probably won't even come back after you get your belly full of ice cream and cake, but that's all right. Uh, so we'll have nothing but Singing Under the Stars tonight, and it'll start at 6 o'clock. We'll send out a, a calling post just to remind you or for those who might not be here this morning. 6 o'clock 
tonight. All right, let's get started. I think we've got uh, either a picture or a video of the nursery. They want to do their bit for, uh, uh, I don't know. If, nope, wrong one. Nursery. There it is, right there. There you go. Is it just the one slide? Yes? All right, that's from our nursery. And then next is Miss Vicky's uh, third, third through sixth. Uh, the presentation is by Reese Ann. Where are you at, Reese Ann? Reese Ann. Come up here and present your uh, cards, awards, whatever you want to do. There you go. Just like your daddy. <laughs> Are you going to say anything? No, you're not going to say anything. She just got cards to give out to preacher and to me. Thank you. And who's this one for? Oh, her daddy. Thank you. Uh oh. <laughs> we'll, that's right. We'll sort them out later. That's okay. Thank you very much. All right, Chris, your group is next. Chris Vardam, and this is our children's church. And then uh, you want to do the video after Children's Church, Chris? Them first and then the teens? Right? Okay. Black. Uh, so for Preacher, we have a card, uh, that, cards that were made by our uh, Kids for Christ. Um, they are all how the kids see you. So um, they're, they all each drew a picture of how they see you, and there's also a card in there. Um, so you'll enjoy seeing how the kids see you. Um, and then for Miss <laughs> Sue Ann, there's some that we had to get rid of and have them redo. But uh, they're good. And then uh, for Pastor Brett um, from the youth group and from uh, the Kids for Christ, we have... Um, the cards that they wrote were memories, their favorite memories with Pastor Brett and Miss Lexi, um, and then a card from the Super Church, so you'll have a good time going through those and seeing what your favorite memories uh, or the kids had with you. Maybe they were not so great for you, I don't know. And then uh, some uh, flowers for Miss Lexi. All right. And then they have, uh, yeah. And now the video. Uh, Mickeyisms. This ought to be interesting. Well, Mickeyisms is a quote or phrase that preacher often uses during one of his service, uh, during one of his messages. So, yeah. It's something that preacher says a lot. Uh, it's like a phrase that only Mickey Oliver would say. A Mickeyism is a statement that preacher says or uses a lot. A Mickeyism is something that preacher says a lot during his sermon. It's something that preacher says a lot. You're a booger. Okay. That's um, that's always been a good one. Hey teenagers. Uh, one of them that I really like is, uh, you're a booger. Always gets me. Oh, <laughs> that's so funny the way he says it. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> He's got a lot of them. I know that much. Is that broccoli is not from God and it was grown off the walls of hell. <laughs> and he says Tennessee is like the land of something. I can't remember what it is. Yeah, sorry. Broccoli is scraped off the walls of hell. Um, he says teenagers are dumb as dirt a lot. 
one last thing. He says that about 10 times in every service. Um, I know when he says, um, you know, it's when teenagers are, um, what do you say, you know, dumb as dirt. He's used that one on me plenty of times. One, another thing that, uh, that I like is God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. Uh, it, 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 it hits me every time too, because it shows you how powerful and how great God is. So. Uh, the bugger one. <laughs> You're a fucker. <laughs> he says that one a lot. Um, he's the head tater. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard him say that. Um, the last thing in will close for the fourth time. I really need it this time. Yeah, he says that one a lot too. Uh, ain't nobody like him. Heard that one. Uh. Listen, guys. Um, this is important and imperative that you get this. You're a booger. You're a booger. He just says that a lot, and it's true, but. <laughs> I've heard you're gonna be in a heap of trouble. He always used my mom in that, actually. And, uh, um, and I think the one that stands out to me the most that, hmm, I like. Because you're the very best Christian that somebody knows. Um, that stands out to me a lot. Listen, guys, and you're a bugger. Booger. <laughs> a booger. Yes. Um, you're as lost as a ball in high weeds. <laughs> and the, next, the last one would be... Uh, You're the very best Christian somebody knows. <laughs> He's the head hater. Probably ain't nobody like him. That's like it. That's... Ain't nobody like him. Not one blessed thing. He says that a lot. Um, I don't think I can. I don't have the southern accent for that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try. Let's try. All right. Uh, you're a bugger. <laughs> when you say it like that, yeah. can you try? Uh, no. <laughs> You're the very best Christian somebody knows. No, I can't. I honestly, he's got a way about saying things. I can't really like. Not one blessed thing. <laughs> All right, now can you say it the way he says it? Not one blessed thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're a bugger. To me, preachers' mess messages and preachings, uh, they're really important to me. They help me get through the next week and just kind of uh, refreshes me, I guess. Uh to whatever I'm going through, so. Really taught me a lot in all my years of going here, which since birth, of course. <laughs> and yeah, just taught me a lot. Well, I feel like preachers preaching has gone along with a lot of things that have been happening in my life. And I have looked back at his sermons and I've read over the notes and read the verses and they have really helped me overcome a lot of things instead of just dealing with them on my own. It's just there's a special way he preaches that I like. I don't know. It's helped me a lot through a lot of things. It's helped me through life. Um, I've learned so much from him. Um, I mean, well, ever since I was born, like almost, but um, I think I start like getting to like his message and stuff like when I start like, um, I think it was about like, Gosh, whenever I started youth group, um, I started like listening and stuff, and um, and um, I just really felt like impacted and stuff from his messages, and um, so now I'm still into his day, and so um, I've learned a lot from him. I'm a better person because of it. I have made better decisions because of the stuff he's told me. I can't 
can't remember the names of any of them. <laughs> um, but uh, I like the online ones, like on YouTube, when during quarantine. Like when I got to watch them from home, they were great. <laughs> Um, the one he recently did, Why Do Bad Things Happen to God's People? I can't think of any right now, but I know if I had like another minute and a half, I could think of one. Um, let's see. I like when he talks about um, Jesus is coming in Revelation, um, because um, I always get hope from it. And, um, and I'm just ready for that day to come. And so um, he just puts that in my head and stuff. I'll just be ready like whenever and stuff, because like, you never know. And so I'm always ready. And like we talk about like the Last Supper, whenever that happens, like we'll always do that, that one week of, and like Easter too, I like those, because it's, even if you've heard it a thousand times, it's just, it's always nice to know that story from memory. I can't remember the title of one of the sermons, but it's about like, but uh, the crowns, like, yeah, so it's just kind of stuck in the, the back of my mind, like, every day, so. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher. Thank you, preacher, uh, for sharing the word of God uh, with us. For sharing the word of God 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 with us. Thank you, Peter, for sharing the Word of God with us. I, I was told I missed a group, the third and fourth graders. Fourth and fifth graders, all right. Four and five-year-olds, I'm sorry. So y'all come on up. We'll do y'all right now, the four and five-year-olds. Where are they at? Oh, this ought to be interesting. Come on, Mercer. All right. You're the man. Thank you, baby. I appreciate that. Are you supposed to give that to me? Does that go too? Is that yours? You taking that home you with you? You want to take it home? <laughs> <laughs> what a booger. Uh, we got Carson coming up. Hey, Carson. I love your bow. Thank you, baby. Miss Sue Ann, right there. Right there. There you go. Thank you, precious. You Good did. job. Oh, and they want to sing a song? All right. Okay. Come on up and sing, guys. I got all day. I don't know what they're going to do, but I got all day. Come on, Carson. Come on, baby. You can, stand right, you can stand right there. It's okay. You don't have to. You can do whatever you want to do. Let her go with Mama. Mama's right there behind her. Okay, yeah, boys. I feel like it sometimes. All right, here we go. Look at Brother Charles. Ready? Right in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army, yes, sir. Good job. <laughs> More. All right. Good job, guys. One of them liked the uh, airplane part better than the other. Matt and Tracy, where are you at? Okay.
Come on up. Thank you. All right, so the young married couples have something special they want to do. Oh, and here comes Anna. You going to introduce this? Yeah. Okay. So our class is a... Yep, okay, our class, um, you know, we're raising families, and we don't have a lot of money, but we really worked hard on a special, special guest that um, our class wanted to present this to you because we're not <clears throat> special guest enough. Um, oh, yeah, there they are. There they are. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. That's worth it all. Made my day. Good job. Amen. Is that all you got? Hey, all Dax. Right. That's Dax, enough. This is, the best, this is the best we got around here. <laughs> all right. If that, that was the young married couples, and I'm responsible for the old married couples, I guess. Middle-aged married couples. Shouldn't say that. So, Lexi, come up here with, with uh, Brett. Let me do y'all first. This is a card from our class to you. We love you. We appreciate you. And then here is a card for Preacher and Sue Ann. But there's a special gift that we bought for Miss Sue Ann. For Preacher? Oh, I thought we was going to give it. Oh, never mind. So... This is what it says. It says, the pastor, because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't official title yet. <laughs> so it just says pastor. Thank you. We love you. And then preacher's class. Who's going to speak for preacher's class? <laughs> oh, not a soul? Did I, did I miss that? Someone doing preacher's class? Okay, I guess they're not very appreciative. Um, <laughs> did I miss any classes? Huh? Oh, they put theirs in the box. Okay, good enough. All right, now then, we've got some testimonies we want to do. And do I need to do them in this order? Okay, Anna, where are you at? Uh oh, you're not nursing, are you? Oh, okay. That'd be a little awkward. <laughs> That'd be, a, that'd be a memory we'd never forget. <laughs> so these are just going to be some short testimonies about, uh, from some folks and what the, our 25th anniversary means. All right. When asked to speak today, I struggled with how I, to summarize the past 23 years I've been a part of New Testament. How do you put into words what Preacher Miss Sue Ann at NTBC has meant to me personally? How do I tell you about all the things Preacher has meant to us? Well... He's been a hotel supervisor when my family and I lived in his backyard for six months. He's been a dog sitter when he dog sat our dog, gave it birthday cake and almost killed it. He's been a shoulder to cry on through family members' cancer and even through unfortunate deaths in the family. He's been a leader through the stupid teen years when I was dumber than dirt. He's been a marriage counselor and then he had the blessing to marry Clay and I. 
He's been a honey bun giver to all three of my children and a blink he'll be to all four. He's been a mentor through some of the darkest days of my life and has been a chaos coordinator during the kid and adult softball games and church picnics. He's always been a phone call away. He's always been a prayer warrior on my behalf and most importantly, he's been my one and only pastor. My pastor to cheer me and my family on when we want to throw our hands in the air during confusion and chaos. He's been the godly man that God has given us to follow and support. Preacher and Miss Sue Ann are nothing short of God's gift to me and my family. I'm so thankful to be saved and baptized under his preacher, preaching. Thankful that he was able to be there to dedicate all three of my babies to the Lord and also guide and direct Clay and I as we raised them to then be able to see my boys saved and baptized. To sum it up, I would say that I'm beyond blessed and honored to have Preacher and Miss Sue Ann in my life. God's been better to us than we deserve. Thank you, Preacher and Miss Sue Ann, for never, never giving up. Even on the darkest days, you've blessed my life and others in millions of ways that you may not know until we get to glory. Thank you. Where's Chuck and Joe at? Y'all are up next. Um, yeah, you can tell we're the older ones, less prepared than anybody, kind of fly by the seat of your pants type of people. But anyway, um, when we were asked to do this, we've known Preacher and Sue Ann since probably August of 1990. Um, when we moved to Loganville, we were looking for a church that reminded us of back home, the close family, and we had no family here, and that's what drew us to where they were. Um, we did, we were under their um, pastor for like, two years maybe before they went to North Carolina and um, when they first came back here our immediate response was like we need to go but we didn't feel like for six months we hesitated we felt like we still had a reason where we were at First Baptist of Loganville and we did we learned a lot while we were there I kind of call it the holding the holding station for us <coughs> uh, a lot happened to us during that time while we were there for the good and for our family's good. And when we came to the New Testament, we were ready to get to work and be part of their team. They've, they've married three of our kids, and hopefully one day, if Garrett can find somebody, they'll you know, <laughs> marry him too. I don't know, but um, they've been around since Tyler was two. They were here when uh, Nick was born. They were here for our grandkids. All of our babies have been dedicated here. Um, and this has just been our, this has been our life. And I, I can't imagine being anywhere else with two other people. Um, we, we are blessed. This is our family. We have no, like I said, we have no family here in town. This is our church family. And they mean the world to us. I remember a preacher saying one time we were having a meeting over at Terry and Becky's house. Uh, and I forget what we were, probably trying to plan something, but it was failing miserably. And preacher has brought up, so what, Chuck and Joe, they can uh, do this and this and this. And we're like, okay. He goes, don't worry about making them mad. You can't run them off. And we're, st <laughs> and we're still here. But uh, it's because they've been such wonderful stewards in our Christian life. And I'll tell you a quick story. I'll tell you the kind of man preacher is. There was one time we were having a thing at the church. We were having a, um, uh, 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 what's a Christmas thing that we did? Spirit of Christmas. Spirit of Christmas. And we were having it over at the old middle school. And Tyler was in middle school. And he was, uh, he had a basketball as a championship game that afternoon. So he brought his basketball uniform with him to, wear, to put on because we're working with the Spirit of Christmas. And he put it on after the service was over and we were doing with the and preacher. He's a cut up. All y'all know him. Y'all know the way he is. Well, he snuck up behind Tyler and he was just going to just playfully just you know like deep handsome just a little bit well Tyler's shorts were a little bit uh, big <laughs> he got seriously deep pantsed <laughs> and of course preacher thought it was funny but unbeknownst to him there were three girls including Anna who was standing over to the side who saw the whole thing and Tyler was just totally mortified and he got in the car when we went home and he says I hate the preacher <laughs> So we got home, Joe got on the phone, and she told the preacher, said, there's an upset uh, teenager that you need to make right. So the preacher went the next day at, uh, at school on Monday, went and picked up Tyler at school, took him to Dairy Queen, I believe, and apologized to him and told him how wrong he was, and he was sorry that he, 
That's the kind of pastor we've got. He understands when he makes a mistake. He makes it right. He tries to live by the word of God. He's been a wonderful pastor to my family and all my boys. And we love him dearly. Meredith, you're up. Brief. Uh, instead of going through how long I've known y'all, I just want to touch on um, the impact you made. Uh, my favorite sermon of yours by far is Abiding in Christ, um, how God is the vine and we're the branches, and if we're going to grow spiritually and produce fruit and more fruit and more fruit, then we have to... Uh, be in the word and getting our nourishment from God. And Miss Sue Ann, she's always such an encouragement. And I don't want to cry. <laughs> I wasn't going to cry, but then Chuck, you messed me up. Um, <laughs> she, you've taught me the, to see God in everything. And I know Preacher says that pretty often about Miss Sue Ann, but it's true. She has taught me that. And I do look for him in everything. He's there, if you just look. And Miss Sue Ann, is um, such a spirit-filled lady, and what she has is very contagious, and she definitely makes me want what she has. And um, Preacher has taught me so many things through the years. I've known him since I was 12, um, my youngest age, which is really strange to say. But you've taught me to trust God no matter what, and you've taught me to love the Word of God with a passion, and to love souls. And I know I would not be the person I am today if it wasn't for the Olivers and the impact you made on my family. And I do want to say, want to add one thing. I am so thankful that we still have Sunday night service because that is really, Amen. through the years, helped me grow. And without that, I, you know, but I'm glad. I'm glad we still have it. Don't, don't ever take it away from us. <laughs> I love y'all. And I love hearing that. Um, did I miss anybody? No? Did any of y'all want to say anything else? No? You sure? Okay, I won't give you a second chance. All right, so they're headed back to Children's Church. Is that right? All right, and then Brett and, and uh, Reese Ann, y'all are next. We'll give them some walkout music if you want to come up and get ready. I'm sorry? No, we're skipping the choir song. Did Lexi and Brett both leave? Oh, stick around for just a second. You got to go upstairs, right? No? Okay. Where's Brett? There he is. Yeah, had to get his new stool. Uh, where'd Miss Sue Ann go? Did she leave on us? Miss Sue Ann? I'm sorry. I meant to. Yeah, come back up here for a minute. So in all these things that have been said and, and all that this morning, you may say, man, I wish I could have participated in that. Well, you can. So as a church, we have some things that we want to give, uh, and nothing says I love you more than cash, right? So we have a check. But we did a little different this year. You know, in the past, we've always given a check to the couple, but we want to recognize the individual efforts that our pastoral staff makes this year. Not only Preacher and Brett, but I know personally, of a lot of things that Lexi and Miss Sue Ann do, uh, that Brett and Preacher just can't. They just can't do it. But Brett and Lex, or, uh, Lexi and Miss Sue Ann do get it done. So I'm going to give you a special thank you. 
I got them out of order here. There you are. And then Preacher and Brett, and I'll just lay yours right there. Thank you so much. We love you, and we appreciate all that you do for us. And uh, we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction into our singing under the stars or singing under the ceiling, pal, however you want to look at it. Uh, this is one of the songs that you'll hear tonight, and uh, this is people in our church uh, that, that, that participate in this, and they sing for God's glory, and we just have a wonderful time, and I want you to listen to the message in this song, and, uh, and let it bless your heart. I want to do this, Terry didn't know what I was going to do. Many of y'all, if you've got a bulletin, I hope that you recognize that we are putting the bulletins back out again. So that you'll get it and read it, you'll understand exactly how I feel about Beck and Terry and what they do around here. Beck and Terry's been the music leader since our get-go. Uh, he is actually responsible for us being here. He called and asked us if we'd become and be a part of this, what's going on. Terry's led the music, never took an, a, taken a dime from our church as far as his salary from what he does. And uh, so for he and thought he had a good idea, we'd give him something and Beck something. And he can give that to her when you find her, okay? All right. Thank you so much. Jesus said that if I thirst, he no one else can satisfy. I should come to him. Jesus said that if I'm weak, I should come to him. No. can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to Him. No one else can be my shield, I should We can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Jesus said that if I'm lost, He will come to me, and He showed me. Thank you. Uh, I promise you I'll have you out here by 12 o'clock. Okay, take your Bible. 
Go with me to uh, the book of Psalm, Psalm 51. Yes. Yes. More. I understand. I do too. I don't bother me in the least, you know. Not. Yeah, she will, I promise. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Not a problem. Psalm 51. This past week, and I've asked permission that I could do this. I don't want y'all to think I'm talking out of turn. Amanda, is this your son? No. Okay. Good. We're glad to have you. Appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. I don't guess I should say that's your son, huh? It's about your age. Sometimes I really stick my foot in it, you know? That's okay. Yeah. Psalm 51. Anyhow, I, uh, like I said, I had asked uh, Keith permission to share this with you, and, and I hope I get it right, and Keith can correct me if I don't, but Keith and I have breakfast together at Kelly's every, every morning, just about every morning, and uh, he and I were talking the other morning, and he shared something with me that really uh, was a blessing to me. He said, you know, preacher, he said, uh, most of the time I would go home at night and when I'd have my nightly prayers, I continue to ask God to forgive me for this and forgive me and forgive me and forgive me. He said, but I want you to know something. He said, when I listened to your message last week on God's forgiveness, he said, I didn't go home and ask God to forgive me like that again. He said, I got up the next morning on Monday morning and said to God, thank you for forgiving me. Sometimes I think that's very important for us to understand that when we ask God to forgive us, we're forgiven. We're not need, we don't need to continue to take these things with us and wear us out because Satan enjoys doing that. And I hope that you'll understand that. And I want to speak for you just a few minutes on this thought, the sweetness of forgiveness. And I, I hope that you'll follow along with me, and I'm going to make a few comments as I read Psalm 51. It's not that, not that long, but you follow as I go along. The psalmist David said in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God. Have mercy. Mercy, David is just simply asking God, God, don't give me what I, de what I deserve. I know what I deserve. I know I deserve hell. I know what I've done. Yes. I know what's brought me to this point in my life. And God, I'm begging you, please show me mercy in my life. And there's probably not a one of us in this room this morning that there's not times in our lives that we don't need to go to God and ask for God's mercy. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. That word blot out there, uh, it, 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 or the transgression means the idea of crossing the line. God, draw, God draws a line, so to speak, and you and I cross the line that God says that we ought not to. We do things we ought not to do. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I, now this is an important verse, verse number three. For I acknowledge my transgressions, not the person beside me, not the person in front of me, not the person behind me. I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge my sin. I, I acknowledge the things that I've done. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Stop looking at everybody else's sin. Stop worrying about what somebody else has done or is doing. Don't worry about them. Worry about you. David had gotten to the place in his life, and David, as his kids said earlier, was a booger. With a capital B, booger. I'll show you some things he did here in just a few minutes. So he says, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee 
and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, that doesn't mean that the act of conception was a sin. What that simply means is simply this, that his mother was a sinner, that his father was a sinner, and because of those two being a sinner, he was conceived in sin. He couldn't help but being a sinner. Verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make uh, me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, and the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and a renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now notice verse 12. This is a verse you need to put a star by in your Bible. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Amen. He didn't say restore my salvation. He says restore. He didn't lose his salvation, but he did lose the joy of his salvation. He lost the joy of his salvation because of his sin. So restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then... Here's the results of being forgiven. Here's the results of the sweetness of forgiveness. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto, unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. Notice verse 15, another good verse. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show praise for shall show forth thy praise. In other words, God, when I am forgiven, then I'll have the ability to praise you. Then I'll be able to do what you've called me to do. Verse 16. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I'd give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Now notice what verse 17 says. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit broken heart, and a broken and contrite. That word contrite means crushed. In other words, God, what's going to get me back to you the way I should be? What's going to get me back to you so that I can tell other people about you? What's going to get me back to you so that I can praise you as I should is a crushed heart, that my heart is absolutely and totally crushed because of my sin. Verse 18, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, with burnt, uh, and with whole offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, for these few minutes that we'll take. Please enable me and empower me to say this in such a way that number one, people will be honest with themselves. They'll see themselves as they are a sinner. And there may be those in this room that will see themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. They've never truly been born again. They might be religious. They very well may be a good person. But if they were to take their last breath today, if they've never been born again, God, that that could be a settled issue in their hearts and lives today. And then I pray for Christians, believers, who has lost the joy of their salvation, that it could be restored. And we'll thank you for what you'll do. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. You know, the more I read this particular psalm and the more I try to meditate on the brokenness of David, and the mercy and the grace of God's forgiveness, the more I am amazed of how of a loving God that you and I serve. How of a long-suffering, how of a kind, and how of a gentle God that we serve. God is not somebody sitting up on a great big white throne somewhere, pounding a, a staff beside him, just looking for an opportunity to throw some lightning at you. 
That's not the God that we serve. We serve the kind of God that loves to forgive. You know, what it is that, that believers need to learn from, from this is that when we are guilty of sin, any sin, now stay with this thought. It doesn't matter how big, it doesn't matter how small, any sin, doesn't matter how far back, doesn't matter how recent, but any sin, you say, well, how am I going to know if, if it's sin? Well, number one, if you are a believer, the Spirit of God will show you. You'll know that. If you're not a believer, you need to understand that uh, you need Christ as Savior to begin with. That's called conviction in your heart and life. So when we are guilty of, of, of sin, any sin, David's, David's life is a very grievous series of sins. And, and I don't have time to really go back to it, but this whole story began back in 2 Samuel chapter number 11 where it talks about David's sin with Bathsheba. We all know the background of how David was uh, on his rooftop one morning when he should have been out, out with the battle with the men. And as he walked along the rooftop across the way there, he saw Bathsheba. Bathsheba was a very lovely lady. And because of that, she was taking a bath. The king could see what was going on. He got the hots for Bathsheba. He had Bathsheba brought to him, and she conceived a child. When she conceived a child, then David sinned. But David had to do something. David, Bathsheba's husband, by the name of Uriah, was one of David's uh, chief uh, soldiers. And he said, man, if I can just get rid of Uriah, I'll be all right. But long story short, uh, he finally had Uriah killed in a battle. Now, so you find David in 2 Samuel 11 committing the sin. And then when you come to the end of chapter 11 and begin to chapter 12 of 2 Samuel... David is confronted by a prophet, a preacher by the name of Nathan. Now, it had been a year from the last of chapter 11 to the first of chapter 12. There had been a year's lapse of time in there. And it was during this year's lapse of time, time that God began to deal with David about his sin. Finally, God saw, God saw that he had seen enough. God sent the preacher to confront him. David was guilty of the sin of murder. He was guilty of the sin of uh, adultery. He was guilty of the sin of lying, of deceit, of deception. Now, you sit there and you say something like this. You say, but preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm not guilty of these acts of, of adultery. I'm not, I'm not guilty of, I've never killed anybody. You know, I'm, I'm, I've not done these things. Those things, you know. Uh, there's a good chance that, that you didn't do all these things. I understand that. I understand that there's a good chance that you never killed anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a good chance that the majority of y'all have never committed adultery. But let me ask you this question. You ever thought about it? I'm not asking you to raise your hand. Please don't do that, okay? You ever thought about murder? You ever thought about adultery? Any of you guys ever seen that woman walk by at the office or somewhere at Walmart or anywhere else it may be in your life? You ever thought of, mm, wonder what that'd be like? You sit there and say, yeah, it's not me, preacher. You're lying through your teeth. My point is simply this, guys. We're all guilty. Doesn't make any difference who we may be. We may not have done and committed the act itself, but we all struggle with these things in the confines of our minds. And David's prayer, which Psalm 51 is, David's prayer was, number one, in verse number 12, would, uh, was, he was hoping it would take place that he could restore the joy of his salvation so that the results would be verse 13. He said, God, restore the joy of my salvation so that I might in turn be able to tell other people about you and about your grace, and about your forgiveness, and about your love. You know, this should be the desire of every believer whose heart and mind has been in fact impacted by sin. In verse 12, again, David doesn't ask that his salvation be restored, but just the joy of his salvation be restored. And then David said, as he got into verse 13, that the byproduct of my forgiveness 
is that he can have an effective witness and a testimony of God's grace and God's forgiveness once again. Now, if you'll stay with me here for just a little bit this morning, you'll be amazed uh, at God's mercy and God's grace, but most of all, of his forgiveness for any and all sin. I want you to think with me for just a minute. And again, I'm not asking you to raise hand. I'm not asking you to speak out because we have times that people around here that do. But I want you to think with me for just a minute of that thing that you've done, whether it be actual or whether it's been in your mind or wherever it may have been in your life. I want you to think about that with me for just a minute and the need of God's grace and the need of God's forgiveness in your heart and life because of that. Because of what's taken place in your heart and in your life. You know, of all of the 150 psalms that are written, Psalm 51 and probably Psalm 23rd is the best known and loved psalms. And they are so personal in, in what they say. And we're all guilty. As, as, you know, we're all guilty of grievous sin and in, and in frequent needs of God's abundant grace in our lives. I think there are several critical lessons about sin and forgiveness in Psalm 51 that we need to understand. I'm going to give them to you real quick, and then I'll give you three points, and then we'll, we'll go eat. I've got to watch that clock, all right? Here's, here's some things you need to notice. Number one, even the most godly people can fall into sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how much you stay in your Bible. I, it doesn't make any difference what you do. Anybody is susceptible to falling into sin. Second thing, sin is serious, causing, in other words, causing an inescapable consequence. My point is simply this. Just one lapse into sin can change our lives and the lives of others forever. One bad decision one wrong choice, one time giving in to some, some lust or some desire can change your life forever. Third thing is, we never sin so grievously that we cannot come to God for forgiveness. That ought to be a time in your life that I ought to have to tell you people, sit down, be quiet. I ought to tell y'all, there's nothing that you can do in your life that God will not forgive you of. If you're willing to ask nothing, Amen. but preacher, you don't understand nothing, right. but pre- there are no buts there, right. nothing that you do in your life that God's not willing to forgive you if, conditional, if you ask him. Another thing is we need to know this is when we confess our sins to God sincerely, he'll forgive and cleanse and restore us regardless of of how appalling the sin is. It doesn't mean that, now watch this, it doesn't mean that the consequences of your sin won't be there. But the forgiveness of God's to you is there. Understand what I just said. You can sin and you can do something so grievous, the fact that God's willing to forgive you, but oftentimes you need to understand that the consequences of your sin is still there. Picture with me for just a minute. You take a hammer and a nail. You walk up to a board, a wall, and you drive that nail in that wall. And we'll say that that nail is sin in your life. And by the grace of God, you're able to take that nail out of that wall and be forgiven for that sin. That's your sin, okay? You may pull that out, but that hole's still there. There's still consequences to the choices that we make in our lives. There's nothing we can do about that. But God will forgive us of our sin. Now, in this particular psalm, as David confessed his sin to the Lord, he made two promises. First promise is found in verse 13, that he would teach others. Teach them what? Teach them how to confess their sin. Teach them how to have a relationship with God. The second thing he says is in found in verses 14, 15, that he would praise God for his boundless mercy and grace. I believe that if there's anything missing in our Baptist churches is praise. That we're not willing to praise God for God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. 
to know that a God would be willing to forgive me of the things that I've done in my life, I can't, I can't praise him enough. I know me. I know my background. And I thank God you don't know my background. And I thank God I don't know yours. Whatever it may be. But that's why I praise God knowing what God has been willing to forgive me of. David fulfilled these two promises in Psalm 51 and in Psalm 32, which is a first cousin to this particular psalm. These two psalms, Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, teach us how to confess our sins and exalt the Lord for his faithfulness and his willingness to forgive and restore us. I want you to understand, I'm going to give you three things real quick. I want you to understand that God's grace is available to you here this morning if you're willing to ask him. Now, if you're content in your sin, you say, I've got absolutely no intent giving up what I'm doing. Then you stay what, doing what you're doing. And if you're a born-again believer, I can promise you one thing. God will whoop your hide. And if you're not born again, it doesn't make any difference anyhow because you're a bastard and you don't belong to him. I'm not trying to be ugly or anything. That's what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. You don't belong to him. I'd rather belong to him and get wore out than not belong to him at all. That's where amen goes right there. Okay? That's the truth. Let me give you some things to consider. Number one, David's cry for mercy and compassion. Now you got to keep in mind almost a year had passed from the end of chapter 11 until the beginning of chapter 12. And Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 is when David was willing to face God with his sin. I think it's important to see that David offered no excuses for his sin. Now, this is something you need to understand, something I need to understand. You and I cannot make excuses for our sin. Notice what he says in verse number 3. He says, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. David offered no excuse for his sin, nor did he allow anyone else to make excuses for his sin. David was utterly broken and saw himself guilty before the Lord. And the Bible says he basically flung himself on the mercy of the Lord. David was, was uh, appealing himself to the Lord and his loving kindness, and his multitude of tender mercy. You'll look, I'll explain in verse number one, that word mercy. This word pictures a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to one who has a need. Let me say that again. The word mercy here pictures a heartfelt response by someone who has something to give to someone who has a need. In other words, put it like this, it's a superior giving something to an inferior. God is giving something to someone who has a need. God gave me, God gives to me on a regular basis his mercy, his forgiveness. The word mercy means simply not getting what you justly deserve. If you got what you deserve and I got what I deserve, I'd all, we'd all be in hell. But it's because of God's mercy. It's just simply a picture of the Lord stooping down to graciously help us when we least deserve it. The second word there is the word loving kindness. This is God's unfailing, steadfast love. His idea of God keeping his promises when, when all else fails. You think about this. Even when we fail him, the Bible says God never fails us. And when, even when we mess up. Lord will never, ever, the Bible teaches us that in 2 Timothy 2.13. I'm not going to take time. But the Lord will never turn his back on us even when we turn our back on him. Right. You know, applying the, that, that particular thought to our sin, he talks about the tender mercies. David refers to God's multitude of tender mercies, meaning that his heartfelt compassion towards us is abundant. It cannot be measured. I think that word tender is important. He could have said just mercy. He said, I offer you tender mercy. Second point. Not only did David cry for mercy and compassion. Second thing, which we need to do. Number two, David admits 
the seriousness of his sin. You'll notice in verses 1 and 2, don't miss this thought, David acknowledged the severity of his sin. You know, it's really amazing how some people are prone to downplay their, their disobedience and make less of their sin than it really is. You know, you see people, if, if they don't feel badly about their wickedness and sin, then they don't expect anybody else should either. If you don't feel bad about what you're doing, if you're not guilty of what you're doing, you can't understand why everybody else is having a problem with it. What's your problem? Why are you looking at me like that, you know? It's my sin to get over it. I'll deal with it. You don't have to worry about it. You see, if people don't, if, if people don't, David basically said this. David made no such attempt to freely admit that his sin was most serious. He said, I'm guilty. I know what I've done. And I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing myself before the mercy of God and asking God to forgive me. David used every Hebrew word available to describe his sin in his effort to purge himself completely. He used everything that the Bible said that they had in Hebrew. He used the word trespasses, iniquity, and sin. The word transgression there means, refers to rebellion against God and his word. In other words, as I said earlier, it means to cross the line. And I, I believe this next statement, if I'm not mistaken, I said it last week, and I believe it with all of my heart. Sin will keep you from the word of God, or the word of God will keep you from sin. You can bank on it. You want to know why some people don't ever show up to church? Knowing that we're going to be faithful to give the truth of the word of God. You know why? They don't want to hear it. I do not want to hear that what I'm doing is wrong. And sure as world, if I go there, that preacher is going to say something like that. Then he uses the word iniquity. The word iniquity carries the idea of something that's crooked, the crookedness of a sinner. And the root meaning of the word has the idea of that which is bent or, or twisted instead of being straight. In other words, by using this word, David was not talking about his outward acts of sin, but he was talking about his inward condition that caused him to sin, the corrupt nature that he has. And the same nature that dwells in you, and the same nature that dwells in me. I don't know about you, but I about wear God out sometime and asking God to forgive me. Absolutely. But God's gracious in all that he does. David confessed that he needed to be washed thoroughly from his iniquity, scrubbed until he was completely clean from the inside out. David knew that unless he was cleansed of his inward lust, he would fall into sin again. And that's the same thing that's true in your life in my life. Number one, David's cry for mercy and compassion. Number two, David admits the seriousness of his sins. And then the last one, number three, David's willingness to admit his guilt. You know, to me, it's amazing how people will downplay the seriousness of their sin. People are also prone to justify their sin or, or to cast blame on others for their sin. They, they, they blame somebody else for what they do. Well, according to Psalm 51, David didn't either. David freely admitted his guilt, fully acknowledging that he had transgressed and rebelled against God's law and all that God said. David was constantly haunted by his sin, even to the place that his guilt caused excruciating pain physically. Not only physically, but spiritually. Keep your finger there. Just go back a couple of pages to Psalm 32. This is the first cousin to Psalm 51. Notice what he says in Psalm 32. Look at verse 3 and 4. David said, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought of summer. Selah. You see when he uses that word by referring to his bones, David was saying first that his entire body was racked with pain because of his sin. 
When he uses the phrase wax old there, that means that he was wasting away. Maybe that he was, maybe he was aging prematurely, it, it, the Bible doesn't say. Maybe he was losing weight, or maybe he was doing both. But the sin was eating his lunch. Goes on to say that it was roaring. Speaks of an outward cry produced by an inward anguish that was going on in his heart and life. He talks about it, and you don't have to turn there, but in, in Psalm 38 and verse number 8, listen to what he says. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of disquietness of my heart. In other words, my heart is broken, and I haven't been willing to do something about it, but finally I am. And that's all God's asking you this morning to recognize that you've got it going on in your life and your willingness to to ask God to forgive you and to cleanse you. Psalm 51 teaches us how to confess our sin. The first lesson is what our attitude is in confession should be. For instance, David's demeanor demonstrates the attitude we all should have who are genuinely broken because of the sin. Let me show you what I mean, and I'm through. Number one, we realize that we don't deserve God's forgiveness, plain and simple. Number two, we cast ourselves on the Lord's mercy. Next, we make no excuses for what we've done. Stop sitting there where you're sitting right now and start thinking of excuses of why you've done what you've done. Stop trying to rationalize. This is why I think. This is why I'm in lust. This is why I have a problem with pornography. This is why I'm struggling so with this, 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 this. We struggle these things because of our sin nature. And we've got somebody that his name's God, Jehovah, that's more than willing to help and cleanse you. You'll just ask him. But what if I go into it again? Well, go to him again. Eventually, you'll get the victory over what you face. We're to cast ourselves on the Lord's mercy. We're to make no excuses for what we've done. We're to acknowledge the severity of our sin, refusing to soften or downplay its gravity. We're not to justify our sin. We're not to blame other people. We have people that blame me for their sin. You say, well, how do they do that? If you wouldn't say that stuff from the pulpit, I wouldn't feel so bad. I'd come back to church there, but I'm not coming back as long as you keep talking about my sin. You're kidding, preacher. Nope. Not at all. I'm not coming back there if you keep talking about my sin. We'll go somewhere else. You know, we living in a time where Scripture talks about, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, we're going to live in times where they're going to tickle your ears to say what you want to say. If you visit around enough, you'll find a preacher that's going to say what you, need to, what you want to hear. I'm not here to make you happy. Amen. I'm here to make you holy. Amen. I'm going to do my dead level best to tell you about the Lord Jesus. I'm going to tell you about how you can be saved. I'm going to tell you about the fact that you can be forgiven of anything and everything that you've done in your life. And not only that, I'm going to go one step farther. I'm going to tell you that God will forgive you after you get saved. You see, God will forgive you for the guilt of your sin. That brings you into the family of God. But God will also forgive you after you get saved. He'll forgive you. And that's exactly what's taking place in David's life. So we're not to blame others for our sin. We're freely to admit our own guilt. Listen, guys, we know that when we cry out to God in humility and brokenness, that God's going to be true to his word and all that he says. He makes a precious and reassuring promise, and I'm through. Go in your Bible to the, to the New Testament. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter number 1, verse 9. I'm going to speak to two people here real quick. Number one, you may be here this morning, and you say, Preacher, I'll be honest with you. If I were to die today, I'm going to be as honest as I can be. Preacher, if I were to die today, I'm not for certain, for sure, I'd go to heaven. 
As a matter of fact, preacher, I, I don't know that anybody can know for certain they're going to go to heaven, but you can. Remember what the Bible says in 1 John, these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. You can know for certain you're going to go to heaven. Well, how can I know that? By asking Jesus Christ to come in your heart and life and be your Savior. By admitting that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And you ask Christ, Christ, I believe that you are the Son of God. I'm asking you today as best I know how. Come in my heart and my life and be my Savior. I'm trusting you and you only. I'm not trusting in my church membership. I'm not trusting I've been baptized. I'm not trusting my name's on the church row. I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus only. That's the first one. Number two is where this verse goes. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. I tell you what, do go all the way back to verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins, the word confess means to see it as God sees it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The preacher, you don't know how bad it is. All unrighteousness. But you don't know what I've done. All unrighteousness. But I've done it more than once. All Amen. unrighteousness. But preacher, you just, all unrighteousness. I'm talking to believers. And I would be willing to say that most of you in this room would profess that you know Christ is Savior. God is willing to offer you the sweetness of of forgiveness. What does that mean, preacher? It means he wipes the slate clean. Amen. It's like a white board, white marking board. Those things are the coolest things. When I was growing up, we had green and black chalkboards. Okay? And, uh, but now they've got those nice white boards. And you take that nice eraser, you can erase everything on that board, and it's gone. Gone, gone. Those old chalkboards, you know, you used to be able to read the word that was up there. You tried your best to erase it, but sometimes you'd see it. These are whiteboards. Your sins are gone. Never. Yes. Preacher, are you telling me, are you honestly saying that what I've done, and me and God know what I've done, God will forgive me if you'll ask him? Absolutely and totally. Father, I, I'm like these folk in this room. I'm amazed of your forgiveness. I'm amazed of your grace. I'm amazed of your loving kindness. I'm, I'm amazed that you love me so much that you gave your son to die upon the cross to pay the price for my sin. I'm, I'm grateful, Lord, that the Spirit of God showed me one day in my life that I was a sinner in need of a Savior, that my religion would not get me to heaven. And I bowed on my face before you and asked you to forgive me and come in my heart and life and be my Savior. And Lord, if there is a man or a woman or a boy or girl in this room this morning that is not freed from the guilt of sin, not the committing of sin, but not free from the guilt of sin, that they would be willing to say something like this and mean it with all of their heart. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. And I'm asking you this morning, as best I know how, to forgive me of my sin, to come into my heart and my life and be my Savior today. And I'm trusting you and you only to save me. And then, Lord, I pray for believers in this room this morning that your word has hit a nerve in their life. They can relate with David. They're guilty of the sin of adultery. They may not have committed it, but they got it going on in their head. And, Lord, they're guilty of these other things, maybe things that I've not named. 
But God, your desire is that we would be a vessel that you could work through this clean. And God, we may have to do the same thing tomorrow. Lord, we just need to be like Keith was that morning to say, Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you that I've enjoyed the forgiveness of the grace of God. And it's my prayer this morning, if that person is in this room, that maybe they want to come to this altar and just kneel before this altar and say to you unashamedly, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for setting me free. Thank you for the word of God and what the preacher said this morning that I can be forgiven. And Lord, we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen and amen. Let's stand, would you please?